fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. A guy that's written some uh, really interesting books. I've been listening to the one lately about cults and conspiracies. So uh, welcome to the show, author Goldwig. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. Um, wow. So uh, that, that book on cults and conspiracies I, I've been listening to, I, I'm sure surprised at how um, planned and organized a lot of these uh, conspiracy groups are. Um, it's fascinating, and it's weird. Um, I wrote the book over 10 years ago, and at the time that I was writing it, I was like learning about conspiracy theory, and I was learning about it as a kind of fringe phenomena that I discovered has always existed in one form or another in periods of uh, different intensity, some periods with great intensity, some periods with less. Um, and now we're talking about it in a time where I don't know if it's ever been so intense. And it just feels more timely than I can stand. <laughs> so, so it's, it's strange. So what do you uh, think about what's been going on recently with the what seems to be a surge in conspiracy theories? Do you think they've moved from the fringe into the mainstream? They are so in the mainstream that I think of like normal sane thinking as kind of a fringe phenomenon now. It's I I I, I have never lived through anything like this. So when does conspiracy theory in your work overlap with cults? Where do those things sort of overlap on a Venn diagram? Well, it's interesting. Uh, again, when I wrote this book, I was sort of discovering the topic. And um, one of the things that I discovered is that cult, the cult leaders tend to be conspiracy theorists. And that um, conspiracy theory often fits neatly into cults. Um, what cult the nature of a cult, practically, is that the leader redefines reality for people. And the nature of a conspiracy theory is that you're redefining reality. You're taking something usually that's the opposite of Occam's razor. Occam's razor is a, you know, it's a medieval philosophical formulation that usually the simplest explanation is the soundest explanation. That the more bells and whistles you require, the less likely it is to be true. So if you have some political theory that involves thousands of participants acting, you know, and maintaining absolute secrecy, and it requires all kinds of coinc seemingly coincidental events to happen. People that didn't know each other, really knowing each other, um, that, that kind of thing. Then, you know, it's, it, it's likely not true. But the conspiracy theorist or the cult leader convinces a group of people that the opposite is true. That the you know the people that are touting science or that are touting reason are crazy, and that they're trying to make you crazy. Now, none of this means that there's no such thing as a conspiracy. There's always been conspiracies. 
And none of this means that the subject of what a lot of cults believe in isn't necessarily true. Um, I'm not I'm not a religious person, but I'm not a committed atheist. I'm open to a lot of religious ideas being true. Um, and um, pretty much every religion began as a cult. Um, the, a, a big, one of the, the, well, I would say there's like two major differences between cults and religions. One is how many people belong to it, and the other is how the leader behaves. Because another common feature of cults is that the, the, the founder leader is very much present and abuses their power. Um, they, 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 they not only try to control their followers' minds, they take possession of their bodies. They, 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 they're rapists often, serial rapists. They commit acts of violence. Um, but then with secret societies, cults, and conspiracies on this Venn diagram, you know, you have, um, you have dictators running a cult of personality that's fueled by conspiracy theories and so on. But again, we live in an era right now where some of the most powerful people in the country, people that aren't on the fringe at all, are proposing conspiracy theories as an explanation for the world. And we live in a country where at least, and I'm going to reveal my politics here, at least one of the political parties is functioning very much like a cult. So, um, and we have a political leader who at least one uh Cult expert just published a book saying is 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 leading the you know is leading the country using mind control techniques that 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 are common to cults. This is Stephen Hassan, and his book I believe it's published by Crown. So it, again, it, we we live in a very strange time, not an unprecedented time. There there have been times in history. That are like this. They're, they're usually pretty bad times, though. So, do you think? And we had Steve on last week. Do you think that that Trump and his followers? Do you think they uh, would would be accurately described as a cult, according to your definition? No, um, because again, it, it cult is such a, a laden term that I would hesitate to use it to describe millions of people. Um, that said, and, and I'm also, a, a lot of these terms, you know, the, it, it's hard to use them accurately because, you know, a, a lot of people will say that, um, you know, Catholicism is a cult or Mormonism as a cult, or Islam as a cult. And what they're really saying is that my belief system is true and this other belief system isn't. Um, if you have a group of a couple thousand people and they all commit suicide because the leader tells them to, you're definitely talking about a cult. Um, but what you do have <laughs> with Trumpism is a willingness to believe the unbelievable, a um, a sense that that um, the, this kind of insular, paranoid sense that the that the leader is um, not only has a monopoly on the truth, but is also a um, potentially victimized. Everyone in the world is out to get this guy, and. Um, but at the same time, he's the only person who can keep you safe. So it's that it's that Venn diagram again. It overlaps in a lot of ways that are disturbing, especially if you're kind of a traditional person that believes in science and that believes in um, you know that ha that that has a, a a rationalist enlightenment point of view on things. 
So oftentimes when we use the term cult, we often have view in mind. So we're not always talking about, you know, millions of people. But we see these sort of fringe groups. But what makes people fall into groups like that? Like when you say cult, I usually think of, uh, you know, maybe the Branch Davidians or um, the people that flew away on the comet wearing the Nikes. You know, so so why do people gravitate to this? I I don't know. Um, I've I've obviously read a lot, and I've talked to a lot of people. I've I've read memoirs by people that that were in cults and left them. I've talked to people. I've known people. I've 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 observed. Um, my sense is that. Um, Rationality is very fragile, and that people can be very needy. Um, the analogy that I keep coming up on with cults is violent, unhappy families. People that are abused by a parent usually reframe the whole world so that the parent isn't abusing them, because it's very, very hard to process that, that the person that you love more than anyone and the person that you depend on to keep you safe is hurting you. Cult leaders use, um, they use techniques to control people's minds, but they can't control anybody. I, when I grew up in the 1960s and 70s, there was a lot of fear that if you were a kid and you were hitchhiking, which I used to do, you know, watch out. Um, someone in a cult is going to pick you up, and the next thing you know, you're going to be a Mooney. You're going to be I, I, whatever other cult it was. I don't think that's really true. I think um, you have to have a susceptibility to this. Otherwise, it, it, it's, it's not going to affect you. But for susceptible people, um, it can be incredibly affecting. And when I look at these groups of hundreds of thousands or millions of people that would rather live in an alternative reality, they tend to be times of, of transition or of um, collapse or of economic insecurity. I mean, we had this great period in, in this country in the 19th century. We had a 30-year depression that that is almost forgotten in popular history from the 1870s to the early 1900s. The uh, agricultural economy began to collapse. Um, millions of people were displaced from their farms and had to move to cities. It was the beginning of modern times, basically. But we also had this uh, 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 agrarian populism that went along with it that had a lot of the characteristics of um, Trumpism today with this tremendous economic insecurity, a, um, a producerist economic view where... where very poor people and very rich people were working together to control to control the world. Um, you had multimillionaire; they were millionaires in those days. They're billionaires nowadays. Cosmopolitan Jews and very very poor communists working together to crush the the the, the, the middle class, the people in the middle. It's it's not that different. Than in in its um, in its broad features, it's not that different. Where you go to Europe and you look at a country like Germany that had just lost a war that was that had come out of this massive um, massive economic collapse, and a very charismatic figure rises up, explains to people that they're victims who their enemies are, and you have Nazism. And in other countries, you had other um, authoritarian political movements. Again, it, usually when you tell people that these things have happened before, you say this in, in a reassuring way. You know, we've survived this before. 
But, you know, when it generally when it's happened on the scale that it's happening on now, it portends something pretty bad. Um, it both ratifies the idea that there's a crisis going on, and it suggests that the crisis could get worse. So it can be pretty scary. So what do you think people need to do to, to sort of escape this? I mean, it seems like we're living in a time where there's always these polls to join these fringe movements. Is there a way to sort of inoculate ourselves or our families to, to these sort of uh, cultish beliefs? I, I, I honestly don't know. Um, at the time that I wrote this book, I was much more confident that there was than I am now, as, you know, the tide is rising. Um, I suppose the most reassuring thing that I get out of history is that, you know, the the, the, the bubble always bursts. Um, you know, the... the um, the tulip bubble or whatever when in Holland in, in the 18th century when, when the price of tulips went up to hundreds of thousands of guilders, um, that was a, a kind of shared craziness um, that eventually collapsed. You know, the, these things reach their limits. Um, people are both be, – human beings are – we have the gift of rationality, and we also have these evolutionary proclivities to follow alpha people. You know, um, apes live in big bands, and there's usually a dominant ape. And eventually the dominant leader gets overthrown. I think we're more rational than we're not rational as a species. Um I hope in this country that that you know that we that the that the, the fever breaks, the bubble bursts, people go back to just being normally crazy instead of incredibly crazy. But again, as as somebody that was writing about this ten or twelve years ago, it's incredible to me how much more intense the phenomena has gotten. What are some of the stranger cults that you've, you've researched? Um, the one that my favorite, when the book first came out, I love to talk about it, were the Hollow Earth groups. Um, because it's Not like... Not Flat a, Earth, but instead a Hollow Earth. Hollow Earth. And the reason I liked it so much is because it's like a metaphor for, for the whole phenomena of cultish thinking. And there was one group I, I can't I can't remember the name of it because I wrote the book a long time ago. It was a guy that was struck by lightning a couple times. He was probably brain damaged. <laughs> this was just after the Civil War, but he had this revelation that the Earth was hollow, and we were living inside the Earth, and we were. Um, what we thought was the sky was really the, the middle of the earth. And he had this whole, he started a cult. He bought land in Florida, which um, Florida has always been a kind of nexus of craziness. The, you know, the, the joke on the internet now that some Florida man did something crazy or grotesque. It was as true back then as it is now, but they 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 he he bought a a, a community he bought, he bought land and built a community and they had a, a community there and he was trying to prove that the earth was convex rather than concave by measuring it with these long um, these long boards. And um, anyway, it just it it was so nutty and so much like a metaphor for I mean, he felt that he was completely sane and that he had seen this thing that nobody else saw. And he got some number of people, not not millions of them, but 
you know, a few hundred people to follow him. And so that, that that's one example of a really strange one. Of course, there's cults that are just horrifically violent, and that's, um, you know, the, 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 the Manson story. That happened over and over again. That happens over and over again. Not usually with strangers. It's usually the violence is enacted on members of the group or um, people that are considered enemies of the group. Um, with Manson, it's very likely that Sharon Tate was was um, she was house sitting for somebody who had. Manson did consider an enemy. He was a music producer that he he had 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 um, made him promises that 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 or in Manson's view had 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 broken promises to make him into a rock star. It's very likely that 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 they weren't there to to kill um, Sharon Tate, but to kill this guy who happened to be away. Um. Those are some examples, anyway. Where does the conspiracy theory then sort of overlap into cults? Like, why do the cults employ conspiracy theories? Is it to explain their status? For example, how come our beliefs haven't taken over the whole country, and then they have a reason for it? It must be a conspiracy against us. Is it? Is it that they're... The cult is founded on a conspiracy theory, like these people are up to no good and we need to thwart them. Um, where, where does the conspiracy theory sort of play into their their ideology usually? Um, I think that the... Um, and again, I have to stop for a second and say, like, not all conspiracies are frauds. Not all crazy ideas are really crazy. Some crazy ideas are actually great discoveries. You know, the, um, the Earth isn't flat. People thought the Earth was flat at one time. The sun doesn't revolve around the Earth. The Earth revolves around the sun. There, there, there are these startling discoveries. Um, somebody that people thought was a good person turns out to be a bad person. A group that people thought was relatively benign. I mean, there was a time when you would say <laughs> there was a time, there was a whole industry in this country, there was a whole publishing industry based on the idea that Catholic priests were sexually abusing innocent people, and that there there was a best-selling memoir in the 19th century about this um, nunnery in Montreal where, where um, young women were systematically abused and a, um, a rationalist, a, a debunker, a professional debunker went up to Montreal and proved that the whole thing was crazy. But 20 years ago, 30 years ago, if you told people that there were dozens and maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of priests that were getting away with abusing children, that there were bishops and cardinals involved in this conspiracy, people would have said, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. It can't be true. So you have to be careful about the things that you dismiss. But to go back to your question, I think that the followers of cults have a need to live in an alternative reality, one where they feel much less threatened and insecure, where they're if if you if you feel like a like a economically and, and socially powerless person um, and you join a cult where you become one of the very few people in the world that have access to the truth, then your status turns upside down and it's a fantastic thing and the cult leader it, it works it's the mirror image of it the cult leader doesn't need to feel stronger themselves they need people to feel weaker and more dependent on them um, they already have this overpowering sense of strength and they want to enact it but 
what's you know again what's interesting when you you know you study the human brain and when you read um, you know when 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 you read experimental psychology objectivity is hard to come by you know our eyes play tricks on us our brains play tricks on us a lot of things that we think are true are not true we're all susceptible um this is why um you know psychedelic drugs can can have the same effect on people that joining a cult can have on people um where you could just um, you could be mentally ill. On the other hand, you could be much more acute than a lot of people and stumble on something that's true. Um, you know, we have a, a a lot of trouble wrapping our minds around really, really advanced physics because you have to know math to understand it. But when you explain it to people without the math that proves it, it sounds really crazy. On the other hand, something like evolution, you don't need to know math to understand it. Um, people think that they can dismiss it from a common sense standpoint. Um, it's, it's an example of a reality that's as hard to grasp in some ways as cultism is hard to grasp in other ways. I'm probably going off on a tangent, so I'll stop. But it's never... You, you have to... At the same time that you have to be aware of how crazy some of this stuff is, you have to avoid using words like crazy, too. So how about when cults sort of overlap with mainstream religion so for example I'm thinking about doomsday cults or people who are expecting the end of the world to come next year or next week um, and then it doesn't and that doesn't seem to dampen their confidence in the cult or its leader um, why are those beliefs so strong that in the face of disconfirming evidence people seem to just hold on to it because cognitive dissonance hurts so badly. There is a, I cannot remember the name of the book. It's one of the best books I've ever read. <laughs> and alas, I can't remember the name of it or the author's name. But the, the founder of cognitive dissonance theory in the 1950s, he found out about a little flying saucer cult that had uh, a leader who predicted the end of the world in like a year. And he was able to infiltrate some of his graduate students into the group because he wanted to see what would happen when the world didn't end in a year. And this happened very famously in the United States in 1839. There was a, a doomsday group called the Millerites, and they picked a date that the world was going to end. It didn't end. And Millerism collapsed, but Seventh-day Adventism grew out of it, and the Jehovah's Witnesses grew out of it. Two very large groups nowadays. Um, and they come out of this disconfirming incident. So back in the 1950s, this guy, whose name I really wish I could remember, infiltrated his graduate students into the group, and indeed the world didn't end, and um, he traced what happened to them, because you could fit all the members of this group into a suburban house. They were easy to trace. It was only about 15 or 20 people. And... The leader of the group continued uh, continued uh, being a cult leader, not like a huge cult leader, but she went on for as long as she lived, leading different groups, um, little marginal followings. Um, some people left the group completely. They were humiliated. But anyway, what... His discovery about cognitive dissonance, when you talk about cognitive dissonance, 
cognitive dissonance is the psychic pain that you feel when um, an idea conflicts with reality. When you when when you believe something, when you believe it with all your heart, and reality just doesn't seem to confirm it. Um, you um, you love your spouse, you just adore your spouse, and everybody tells you that your spouse is cheating on you, and you finally see them cheating on you. And some people, if they have to choose between what they, what they believe and what they know to be true, they choose what they believe because that's the way that, that, that you um, resolve the pain. You just rule out what seems obvious. Um, some people really do that. Um, it's very, very painful to have to give up a belief that, that, that you hold dear. Um, it's easier to build a crazy machine with a million moving parts that will prove that um, my spouse isn't cheating on me. That was really his, you know, that was really her long lost brother who has a different name and, and what I saw I didn't really see because they wanted me to think this so that I would and it's a kind it's a kind of craziness but it comes out of a place of pain and a place of need i think um i don't feel threatened by the members of cults particularly um i feel very threatened by their leaders and what they can make the members of cults do because they can send them off to kill people sometimes um, but anyway, I, I the, again, there, there's very, very good psychological books on what makes up uh, an authoritarian social group and how how it functions and the tools that the leader does to chip away at people's agency and their sense of reality and so on. Um, it's all fascinating to me. I don't. I, I believe a lot of it, but I. But I don't. I'm not a psychologist myself. Um, I'm kind of a like a, an interested humanist, and I feel the pathos in a lot of this. I, I feel bad for people. I feel bad for people that 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 live in an, in a in a alternate epistemic system, an epistemic bubble, as it's called sometimes. It, 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 it's sad. It speaks to me of, of, of great pain. Is there a role for the government to play? I mean, you're, you've been talking about cults and how they resemble, you know, violent families or, you know, the word violence has come up a few times in this discussion. Is there a role for the government to sort of address this? I mean, I... Obviously, there would be free speech issues and freedom of association issues, but is there a point where, you know, cults, um, you know, move beyond that? I mean, is there a point to step in, um, you know, after violence is committed or before violence is committed? Or well, Ten years ago, a scholar and government official wrote an essay where he suggested that the government try to um, plant people in cults and change their way of thinking. And um, boy, did it backfire. <laughs> because uh, he was talking specifically about hate groups, which is a whole different phenomenon that I wrote a book about that's related to this. But it, you know, it, it, it both validated the paranoia of these groups. Look, the government really is going to infiltrate people into our group and try to change our way of thinking. Who's the, who's the conspiracy here? Who's the, you know, who's trying to distort reality? Who's trying to change us? It was, um, so 
Now, I mean, like, if you're going to try to inoculate the country against a, a specific group, you're probably going to get in trouble. On the other hand, if you're in law enforcement and, you know, the, there's a known hate group that's preaching violence, yeah, you should watch it. You should be aware of it. And um, often, you know, the. I mean, the, again, it's like every, everything I'm saying is ripped out of the headlines. You know, when you have a um, – just, just in the last couple of days, um, Stephen Miller's emails that he was sending to Breitbart when he was working for Sessions – when Sessions was still a senator and he was working for them, for him, he was pitching article ideas to Breitbart about how evil immigrants are, or um, he, and he was sending them articles from pub the publication of American Renaissance, which is a, um, it's basically a hate group. It. it it's Jared Taylor's white supremacist group. It, they they hold conferences like they're a like they're um, you know like they're an academic group, but m most people will call them a hate group. How do you, how do you um, how how do you stop them? I don't think you do it by infiltrating people into them. You do it by um, people like me. Um, you know, trying to – other people writing books that, that are saying, look, we have this phenomena. There, there is another side to this. There's a way to understand this. There's a – can you cure the people? I don't know. Um, again, not everybody is susceptible to this. Um, and people – when you look at the history of this and you look at – the really broad phenomena of how paranoid thinking works. People tend to be paranoid in the same ways and they're afraid of the same things. When people get Alzheimer's disease, so many people decide that one of their caregivers is stealing from them. So many, you know, they, there's these patterns of, of disrupted thought that appear. Um, the Boston Marathon bomber um the the kid one of the brothers was taking helping his mother take care of a guy who had suffered terrible brain damage and in the i don't remember how how it happened to him i think he was mugged and um over the course of time he became incredibly paranoid and introduce this kid to all of this literature about, um, uh, I don't, don't even remember the nature of the literature, but it was, it was paranoid, paranoid literature. Um, there's a connection, I think, between sometimes it's brain damage, sometimes it's brain structure, sometimes it's, um, it's psychological damage, psychological vulnerability. Not everybody falls for this stuff. And that's something that you need to remember even, especially in a time when so many people seem to be falling for it. Well, it's never going to be everybody. So, um, I mean, we've seen damage in the past where government has tried to I guess, step in with some of these cults. And sometimes it goes well and sometimes it doesn't. Like with the Branch like, Davidians. Yeah, like what, what do you think could have been done differently with the Branch Davidians? There you have, I mean, some people escaped, but a lot of people died. Um, what could we do better in dealing with these groups? Um, to me, that was an example of... Um it's like when the, when somebody calls the police because a family member hasn't taken their insulin and they're walking around disoriented 
and the police come and shoot them. Uh, that was that on a very large scale. Mm. They, um, I suppose they were afraid that the kids were being harmed, but they weren't going anywhere. And I think, you know, when people aren't going anywhere, when, when you surround them and, 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 and wait them out, you negotiate with them. There was this impatience, I think. I mean, I think the Branch Davidian story, it's a terrible story. It's, it's a horrible mistake. And it also fed, it fed more, more extreme violence. You know, the Oklahoma City bombing, I, didn't it, didn't that occur on the anniversary of, of the Branch Davidian? I believe yeah, it, did. it did. I yeah. mean, it, it, it fed, it, it fed the paranoia. It fed the, um, so the government should be, should be super careful at the same time that, that it's, that it's aware of things. I, again, when you, when you're dealing with, um, thought contagions, I think you, um, you know, you need to, maybe, maybe it would help to talk to epidemiologists about how they control germs. <laughs> Um, it would certainly help to talk to computer scientists about how ideas get get propagated. Um, but I think that you know sometimes government's the culprit in these things too. I mean, sometimes the government is the enemy. So again, I, I hesitate to, to give answers because. But I think if 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 you understand that there's tremendous challenges. You're, 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 you're already better off than if you step in thinking that you can, you know, take care of it in one stroke. So there's been one group that I've been watching for the last few years, and that's, that's the Lyndon LaRouche group. And they go by the name LaRouche Pack. And he's recently died, so I'm, I'm sort of watching to see what goes on with that, with that group. And they're, they're, you know, a cult in the sense that they, they had an extreme devotion to Lyndon LaRouche, their leader, um, but they were very much decentralized. So LaRouche was somewhere, and then everyone else was sort of dispersed across different cities, and they would go out and spread their um, spread their message. Um, where do you see that going? I'm assuming that, that the LaRouche group itself is going to disappear, although they were just in the news a couple of weeks ago. One, one of their members um, um, showed up at, at a um, Ocasio-Cortez town hall and disrupted it, mm-hmm. and it was just – I was surprised that, that they were still around, but but – but I guess they were. LaRouche's ideas, though, that he had so many... Cr- I mean, he, he he was an example of a cult leader who, who could have been in a cult, too. I mean, <laughs> he, he started out as, as, a, as a communist. He ended up in this very right-wing group. And he founded a lot of his thinking on, on the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is like the the most cut and pasted conspiracy theory ever. Um, pretty much every conspiracy theory since the 1890s, whether they're anti-Semitic or not, has taken its form and its structure from the protocols. And the protocols themselves were cut and pasted from anti-Masonic conspiracy theory, which was a huge, huge thing in this country. In the 1820s, most Americans, you, do, you, do, you don't learn in elementary school civics class that Americans used to be terrified of Masons and that we hated Catholics. And like, like you're going to say two things about the United States before 1830. It would be that, you know, Americans really hate Catholics and they really hate Masons. And nobody would know any of these things now. Um, and Catholicism was a foundational hatred in America that just disappeared. Um, it just, it, it dissipated after the, after Kennedy was elected. 
Um, probably the fact that Kennedy even got elected was a sign that it was already disappearing. But, you know, I live in Brooklyn, and Brooklyn is just full of abandoned church, Catholic church facilities, um, monasteries, nunneries, gigantic churches, um, schools, parochial schools that, that, that aren't in business anymore. Because American Catholics used to have a completely separate social infrastructure. Um, they, they were taught in separate schools. They had, I mean, it was just, it's gone. This is a whole side of America that's just gone. It's changed. Um, some things really do change. I think um, America was never an anti-Semitic country in the way that European countries were. There was a lot of anti-Semitism in the country, but we didn't have, the, it, it, the government wasn't propagating it. Um, a lot of the a lot of the structures of anti-Semitic thought have just been refitted onto anti onto Islamophobia now. Um, the exact same things that people were saying about Jews are being said about Islamic people now, and some of the loudest people that are saying it are Jews, and they don't even know that they're like citing. That they're, that they're quoting the protocols of the elders of Zion. It's, it's strange, and I do not remember how I got onto this tangent, so I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> so l l let me ask you a question. Um, where, when you see these conspiracy theories sort of going across the Internet and then bleeding into mainstream news coverage, like, for example, the idea that Jeffrey Epstein, the billionaire philanthropist who... Um, was running a, a sex trafficking ring. Um, when you see that stuff propagating, what goes through your mind when you see, you know, now there seem to be, you know, members of the House of Representatives pushing this theory that well, either ex maybe. Except it's true. That's what's so horrifying to me. That it, it's. It, people. <sighs> I, I've read so much vile conspiracy theory that, um, well, let me, let me go all the way back to the 1700s um, and, and the fear of Masons. One of the, um, there was this thing, the Hellfire Club, and it was these incredibly libertine, corrupt, free-thinking Masons. They had these sex clubs. Benjamin Franklin was a member of it, and there was a club, it was either in London or Paris, I can't remember now, but it was called the Hellfire Club, and they were, like, abusing young women there and, and worshipping Satan, and um, their stories, um, Alex Jones, when he was first starting out, he wrote a crazy book about the... Um, about the the um, the summer camp for millionaires in, in California, I can't remember the name of it, but Bohemian Grove, and and he he um, he infiltrated it, and he saw this pageant that they've been putting on there since the 19th century, and he interpreted it as a like cannibalistic rite from from ancient Babylonia. Crazy, crazy stuff, and described all this, you know, this um, human sacrifice and blood drinking and sex stuff, and it just sounds insane. And then you've got this Jewish billionaire with ties to extremely well-known scientists and political figures, and he's doing this. He has it. it it's real. It's true. It, it isn't. It isn't a made-up thing that he was abusing all these women. And then he dies in jail um, in a place where people were supposed to be watching him. I think that it's very plausible that he commits suicide. If I were him, I would have committed suicide. He was not happy at all being in prison, and he had dodged that bullet once. He wasn't going to dodge it a second time. But... 
I'm not going to get up on a pulpit or go on the radio either and say, how could anyone think something as ridiculous as that somebody killed him? Because lots of people had reason to kill him. I don't, you know, I don't know. This is why, again, this is why I said at the beginning of this conversation, I've been thrown for a loop by this world that we live in now, where some of these things that 10, 15 years ago I would have said are just crazy, this could never happen. The government wouldn't be propagating theories like this. Only people on the fringe would, or very bad people in the government that don't really believe it and are doing it to get some advantage. Uh, to you know because it because they're demagogues um, we're living in times now where some of the stuff turns out to be true maybe some of this is um, maybe some of the reason that conspiracy theory is so incredibly tempting for some people to fall into is because some of it's true um, it's human nature that very very rich people test test maybe they test test limits maybe that maybe it's actually true that that if you um you know that the more billionaires do bad stuff than more middle class people i don't know um there aren't that many billionaires so you can't really do that much statistical studies of them there's there's only i think 600 in the country um and Epstein probably wasn't really a billionaire either. Um, <laughs> but he was exactly like something that a conspiracy theorist would have made up. <laughs> I mean, I was really thrown. I was just, I was flabbergasted. I'm not saying that it's all true, yeah. but that one really threw me. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Well, our, our our time is coming to a close. And now, do you have a website that people can go to if you uh, if they want to look you up? Um, about your book? Yeah, I haven't written a book for a while. I don't have anything that I'm currently selling, but I have a website where I write about my ideas occasionally, um, and all my books are listed on it and reviews and so on. And it's just ArthurGoldwag.com. I have an uncommon enough name that I don't have to do anything fancy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have that. We're going to have that linked up on our site too, so uh, people can just do one click. Again, our guest has been author Goldwag. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having me. You've been listening to the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our guests, hosts. All shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.